My name is Laura. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a teen librarian at the Copley branch of the Boston Public Library. Today, um, we are going to be talking about Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson for our reading together year-long 
reading challenge. Uh, this month's theme is a book by an LGBTQ author. And I am joined by my two reading pals over here, if you guys want to introduce yourself. Um, hi, my name is Michelle. I use she, her pronouns, and I also work at Teen Central at Copley for the Boston Public Library. And I'm Allie. I use she, her pronouns, and I work out at the Brighton Branch for the Boston Public Library. And this is our first time, I think, second time, I don't know, doing this from back at the library. So there may be some more technical difficulties, hopefully not. But if there are, we're just going to charge through them. Um, but if you guys have any questions, thoughts about the book, you want suggestions about other books, let us know in the chat and we'll get started. Yes. So first we're gonna be talking about just in general, the idea of race in this book, which is a memoir written in verse about a young black girl growing up in kind of the civil rights era. So there's a lot to talk about here. So we will go to our first quote. The way we kind of frame these things is letting quotes dictate our discussion. But if you have other things you want to talk about, we would love to hear your thoughts. Um, so the first quote that we have pulled is after the night falls and it is safe for brown people to leave the South without getting stopped and sometimes beaten and always questioned. Um, and this is about her and her mother going back up um, from where her mother's family lives in the South, back up to the North. Um, and I just thought this was an interesting starting point because I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily think that the night falling would make it safe or would make it any safer. Um, and I think you see a lot throughout this book that she is a very young child who doesn't fully understand what she's facing as a black woman. Um, yeah. I don't know. Any other thoughts? I liked this because it gives, I think, a lot of historical context right away. So in the United States, particularly during the civil rights movement, there what were known as sundown towns. And sundown towns were places that were unsafe to be black after dark. Um, and this, you, I think the most prominent presence of it in media currently is in Lovecraft, Lovecraft country, um, which you should get your parents' permission to watch. But um it's just this idea, right, that she doesn't understand as a child why they have to travel at night. But as an adult now, she can phrase it in this way where we as the reader understand what's going on. But she as a kid didn't really get it. Um, and I just think it gives you like this great insight, not only to the historical context that she's growing up in, but also her place within that. Because for her, she didn't think about it as a, as a kid, really. I think she does a good job of that in general in the beginning of the book because it starts off literally, I think, like when she was born and the story of her birth. Um, so I, I'm sure she doesn't have a lot of her own memories from that time. But I think putting things in like this gives you, it was able to give you a lot of context for what you were reading essentially and like put you more in that environment of like what when she was like the first few years of her life. Yeah, there yeah. were quite a few mentions. Um, I don't think we pulled a quote from it about the like segregation on buses mm -hmm. and about how there they had supposedly done away with the segregation on buses. But when her grandmother would take her and her siblings onto a bus, they would just go to the back because they didn't want any trouble. They didn't want the confrontation. And that was just kind of still the expectation, even though they did have a right to the front seats. Um, and I think as a kid, we watched, she took many buses, I think, throughout the story. And we watch yeah. a little bit more each time her gaining that awareness of like, 
why do I have to do this? I'm just as good as any white person, you know? So we see her go from curled up in her mother's lap, being held in her mother's arms at the back of the bus to her actually starting to voice the question of why do I have to sit at the back of the bus? And I thought that was a really cool way to show her growing and moving forward while literally also using transportation. I think that's, oh. oh, you can go. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, well, I was gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say, I think they also do a, a good job of talking about that in reference to like growing up in the south versus growing up in the in the north of where her because they first are in Ohio and they have a conversation. I think I believe it's her father and her mother have a conversation of being, and he's like, "I'm not doing that," and there's an expectation that in the south, even though like you know it things are like better whatever that means in any context um there's an expectation that you still have to follow those rules and he was like i'm not going to be a part of that i will not go to back to the south because of that um and so yeah it's it's kind of like a small theme throughout the throughout the whole book yeah i was just gonna say i think that bus example is an interesting example in terms of this book of how things might change but they also don't really change and just this idea of the generational divide that oftentimes the younger generations can get really frustrated with older generations because they want to take action immediately on things like this whereas older generations who have lived through even like getting to the point things are at now might be a little more like you know this has been progress and I don't want to rock the boat I don't want to risk my safety when we've already gotten here which I think probably teens today can also really relate to yeah I mean, Jacqueline's story is like really, I think, in a way universal, especially for non-white Americans. Um, I mean, sundown towns still exist and they're not really called sundown towns and they're not really, you know, like a thing that people are super aware of. But there are places in this country where it is not safe to be black after dark. Um, And so it also like for us as readers reading this now to kind of almost still be in that same place. And like, we're trying to obviously like, the goal is to push forward, push forward, push forward in the same way that Jackie would push forward on like sitting at the back of the bus, our generation is still pushing forward on this idea of like, what does it mean to be black in America? Sure. All right, I'll go to the next quote. So now we have, we are safe here, miles and years away from Bible times. And religion plays a big role throughout this book. I didn't really include a lot about that in the quote, just because I think that can be a little bit more of like a touchy subject for us to be talking about. Um, But I thought this was kind of another example of how much she is really a child throughout this story where she's read the Bible. That's a very big part of her life. And she kind of thinks like, oh, look how wild and violent and like everything and upheaval things were then. But like, we're safe now. I'm safe now. I don't need to worry about things and just not really realizing the reality and kind of coming to terms with that a little through the story. I don't know. I think, you know, religion does play a large part in her narrative. And so for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to read it yet, um, Jacqueline is raised Jehovah's Witness by her grandparents, um, her grandmother specifically. And there is this idea, I think, right? We see this play out in a lot of different ways, not just religion and not just the specific religion of like things were worse and now things are better. And that's like status quo. And so I think when we're talking about that generational gap, we also have to talk about where generations start and where they end. So for her grandmother, she, and we're going to get into this, I think in the next quote a little bit more, but she saw 
the beginning of the civil rights era and Jacqueline really is starting to come into it at the like the tail end of that part of the civil rights era. And so for her, for grandma, we have gone really far from where we came. We have gone from Bible times. We're safe now. And for Jacqueline, because her starting point is so much closer, she feels separated from Bible times, but eventually she will feel that she has gotten even farther from where she started. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, sure. we can go to the next quote. So this one is, even when my girls were little, we'd go down there, my grandmother tells us, and people to be marching. The marching didn't just start yesterday. Um, and this is the grandmother that Allie was talking about. Um, so again, just this idea that the older generations have lived through so much of this and they've seen changes, but they've also seen like, this is still necessary and we still need to be marching. And like, again, very relatable today. Mm -hmm. I was definitely getting like flashbacks to my own, like, like thoughts of like, things that I have, like, I feel like this grandmother at times. When I saw a lot of the things that had been last summer, I was like, these are these are not new narratives. These are not new stories. These are not new anything. All of this has been and continues to be a, a story of what it is to be Black in this country. And and so I, I, I enjoyed this book, but I also felt like there were a lot of characters in this book where I was like, man, I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about her grandmother. And I would really love to hear more about, so those are like, that was definitely a moment where I was like, man, I want to hear, like, that is an interesting to me. I'm like, what was it to be like, like, I think the civil rights movement was so amazing because it was started by all these young people, but I can't imagine what it would have been like to be 60 during the civil rights movement and it's see so much happen so quickly and also feel like but there's like yeah i don't know it was i i felt that reading that and also lots of things in that in like that whole storyline yeah, definitely um yeah i know michelle and i uh, talked about like so many characters in her family you just want to know more about uh, and the grandmother is definitely one of them. Um, we'll go to the next quote. And this one is a little tiny, so excuse my squinting. The revolution. Laura, do you want me to read it? I have it up bigger. Oh, beautiful. Go for yeah. it. The revolution is always going to be happening. I want to write this down, that the revolution is like a merry-go-round. History always being made somewhere. And maybe for a short time, we're part of that history. And then the ride stops and our turn is over. I love this quote. Thank you for picking it. It was maybe, I think this is my favorite quote from the book. Oh, same for sure. Mm -hmm. Also the use of revolution and merry-go-round and the like round kind of like the circular existence of the word revolution. Um, I think... The ride stops and our turn is over is also something that I that really stuck out to me because as we grow older, right, younger generations have different priorities. And we saw that we see that like with really farther back generations, but we see that with like, you know, Gen X and millennials and Gen Z, we see the different priorities. And at some point, your time is over and it's time to let someone else take up take up the mantle of the revolution and i thought this was a really cool way to put it uh, definitely i mean i think we've really like talked about what this quote is about but i agree that this is my favorite quote in there and i think really powerful all right next quote do you want me do you want me to do the quotes, Laura? Because I have them up. If it is so easy for you, yeah. go for it. Um, mm -hmm. So next up, we're going to talk about the idea of 
home and what home means um, throughout this book. Jacqueline moves a few different times. We've kind of already spoken to that a little bit, but she moves from Ohio down south and then she moves back up north. Um, And for her parents too, there's a lot of discussion about what home means to them. Um, So this is the first quote that we pulled on that. Ohio is where my father wants to be, but to my mother, Ohio will never be home. I feel like an audiobook narrator. You are. I mean, (laughs) you're an (laughs) actor. If you haven't watched Allie's program with the audiobook voice actor, Amir, who did the Tristan Strong books, check that out on our YouTube. Um, Dramatic Mom says they think they read this in eighth grade. Probably this is a big eighth grade read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is on the summer reading list, I want to say, for third through five and six through eight. Yeah. Or whatever the breakdown is. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I think this quote just kind of gets right into the issues between her parents and how her father just will not leave Ohio and her mom didn't grow up there she grew up in this very small southern town and that's always going to be part of who she is what i thought was really interesting was that in the afterward or the acknowledgements or something at the end she talks about how she reconnected with her father when she was 14 yeah. and this book ends when she is about 11 or 12 and that's another story that i was like oh i would have really liked to have heard this story like i how wanted to know what happened dad? I wanted to know what happened. And it doesn't, yeah, she, her father is like not, not looked terribly in the book, but there definitely is like, there's no mention of him really after Mm -hmm. like midway through half of the book. And so then to like, and it's a significant acknowledgement to him at the end. Yeah. Thank you for all of the, and I was like, wait, what? Like, it's a real. Her Shit. aunt, too. Like, yeah. her aunt that she had yeah. totally lost touch with. And, like, to the point where I think at one point in the book, her sister says something along the lines of, like, he's our only uncle about mom's brother. But they have more uncle. Like, we never got back to that dichotomy. And I wish we had seen a little bit more of that. Yeah. Um, should we move to the next quote? Since, like, a lot of these quotes are intertwining. Yes, but I did also cut Michelle off, so I want to oh. give her a chance if she wants Oh, to. I was just going to say, I'm sure this is going to come up. There's a lot of significance about location and family, and mm. that's kind of like the beginning of it. All of her father's family is in Ohio. All of her family is in the South at that time, and so they just want to be close to their family. And then, what is family? You know, we'll get into that, I'm sure. You are from the North, our mother says. You know the right way to speak. This one. There. Yes. Um, Yep. (laughs) I think interesting that her mother, who's so connected to her identity as a woman who grew up in the South, is the one who's like you need to be code switching if you talk like you are from the south or you talk using any kind of dialect or slang like that's not the right way to speak Mm -hmm. which yes a lot to unpack and a upsetting reality there's a yeah. couple of times in the book, too, where it's mentioned that the, when they're in the South with the kids from school and and their camps and playgroups, that the kids make fun of how they speak because they talk fast and they don't abbreviate and stuff like that. Um, so I think it's really interesting, like Laura said, that this woman who is so tied to her Southern roots wants so badly to be seen as like educated and that for her is equal to being from the North or sounding like you're from the North. Definitely a lot of like respectability politics Mm -hmm. that are unfortunately still present today. 
in lots of different communities, especially the black community though. And especially, I think there's like a Northern, I'm only from the North, so I cannot speak to what it is like, but I do, I think there is definitely even like a culture, like an American culture of like having a Southern accent sounds dumb. And like, and that kind of being like the way, and even accents in general, I feel like, I mean, we all are in, Boston right now, a very highly educated city, and you can feel like that people, like, there's like an attitude of like, if you sound like, if you have a strong accent, either way, that isn't, that isn't foreign, aka like, foreign in a like, European white way, then you sound dumb. Right. Or then you sound uneducated. Yeah. And not great, not a good thing. Definitely don't agree. That was, um, Michelle was about to come out as like pro linguistic. I'm bias. like, yes, <laughs> yes. Everyone should sound like me, obviously. Um, the same. I'm the same. Yeah, please. Um, I'm like, wait until like 9 p.m. And then I just sound like I'm from the Bronx and it is a good time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's also definitely, I mean, it unfortunately is it is a little bit of like i think there is an assimilation like thing in the black community as well to be like this you need to sound like this to white people because then you will be i mean it's also like a safety thing then you will be safe because then they'll think you're smart and there's a lot of didn't i mean i understood but all the stuff about her sister being smart was like so gross but also like so true and I'm sure like that was just what, it, and, and it's like, it's hard to look at it in a lens now because of like what I think of it now as someone who's like, no, like every kid is in a different situation. But at that time they're like, no, this is, this is so you can be safe. So you can get a job, so you can take care of yourself. You should sound like this. You should act like this. Yeah. Um, and the tagline in the chats is that it's interesting that her mom says um, to talk like you're from the north when people from Ohio would even talk differently from people than people from New York. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's true. And I think that speaks to what Michelle mentioned in that I think Southern accents in particular as a society, we still haven't really reckoned with how stereotypes people are against that particular accent yeah it's very apparent in like television shows and movies and whatnot that when people speak accent neutral what they mean is northeast america and it's very much like that is what you need to strive for and that is what is most represented and then it's like the it's like the english accent of like if europe right like it's the one that everyone is always like ooh, that's what i want to have like that is the like the tongue of that land and that's just not true um and because we've set up like this standard for language anything that is not immediately identifiable as like accent neutral means that you're being bumped down like with an implicit bias kind of situation. Yeah. And that even like newscasters and actors will take lessons to change their accent to a broad American neutral accent. So for sure. That's I just something. say it's always trash too. Like it's oh, always yeah. a trash oh, accent. Yeah. Oh my God. Just, uh, just. So terrible. Uh, all right. Um, the undoing if you haven't watched that get your parents permission but also yes. the american accents in that I, Nicole, there was... i love you but girl enough oh halfway through she just was like i'm australian whatever <laughs> like it truly she just gives up all right let's go to the next quote <laughs> everyone else has gone away and now coming back home isn't really coming back home at all Oof. was a doozy. I liked this quote as someone from a small town. Like that makes sense. It made sense to me. 
Yeah. Like everyone, everyone her mom loved in the hometown, the reason her mom would go back, have all moved away. So does that, is it still a homecoming if there's no one there to greet you? Like that. Yeah, I think it really speaks to the fact that as much as everyone in this book is really obsessed with location, that really what makes your home is people. I think, too, it is also a little bit generational in the sense that the grandparents have stayed in the South where they have roots and all of their children move North. Um, and it's this idea, right, of like, when did we stop living with our elders? When did we stop caring for each other in that sense? Um, when did the priorities kind of shift a little bit? And moving away from your family, especially elderly parents, is particularly, I think, difficult. And we kind of saw that firsthand in this book, um, which I'm sure I think we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about family again later. So, All right, move on to the next quote. I want to ask, will there always be a road? Will there always be a bus? Will we always have to choose between home and home? I think, again, just this idea that everyone else in her life has this set idea of this is home. Her mom, even though she's so attached to the South, also kind of always wants to be reaching for something else. And Jacqueline really wishes they could just settle somewhere. But on that same idea all these places are home to her and she doesn't want to have to choose between them I felt that as like a child <laughs> i feel that now i like my whole family is somewhere else and i live here in Boston, and it's great but there's definitely like i do feel like both of these places are home mostly because i have a more of my yeah uh, all of the things, all of, you know, every, I think also every, it, it's fun to like kind of track the different ways that she grows in all of these different places. And I think that is um, like very indicative of like, oh yeah, this is home to me because like Ohio is a home because it's where she was born and where her father is and her father's family. Then the South is a home because I think it's the first time she like had essentially like a real growing up with a father figure and her grandfather and and then new york becomes a home because she starts to like have her own like personality and her own like she gets a friend who's not related to her and like all of these things and and yeah you just see kind of like the different places and how she grew grew up in all of them sure. all right next quote we don't know how to come home and leave home behind us. This really just follows up what we just talked about, this idea that she has so many homes. And I think this is particularly true of her mom. How do you make one place your home without always yearning for the places that were your home before? I loved how you just put that. I have nothing Thank to Thank you, because I can't relate to any of this because I've always lived within 30 minutes of the same place. That's, yeah. I mean, I'm not even that far. I'm only an hour, but I, I do feel that, so. So Michelle's our expert here on having yes. two homes. Um, uh, definitely uh, all your expert needs about living, I mean, <laughs> It's not, it, I sound like it's it's four hours away. Like, so there are people who- So far. It, it's, it is far, but also like, um, you know, I could go home in a day. Yeah. If I wanted to, wanted to. Yeah, I think but. this is also interesting too, because I think like, I, again, only have to talk about my one hour of travel, but it is like, you are different a little bit Mm -hmm. in your different homes and oh, as much as you try not to be you're informed by that environment so i like to think that i'm mostly the same when i go home to my small town and when i live here in the city but i know that there are things that i do when i go home to my parents that i don't do when i'm here and then they're like vice versa and so how do you 
call one place home when you're maybe still not being fully your complete self, but then you go back to the other place you call home and you still maybe don't tap into every part of yourself. Yeah. I don't know that it's really touched on in this book since she is pretty young throughout the whole thing, but one thing teens looking into your future that definitely happens when you're older is when you go from your house or apartment back to your parents house or apartment as an adult there definitely can be a regression to like being more of a child to your parents and like oh you're gonna make me dinner like you're gonna do these things that i would normally do um so it really is interesting to think about how you can have like different homes and be a little different in all sorts of different ways in them. But we can go to the next quote. Um, so next we're gonna talk about the idea of family and like the legacy of family and your family members who have come before you, which definitely ties into this idea of home since obviously we've talked a lot about before that her mom in particular is very tied to her family home um so we'll go to the first quote in this in south carolina we become the grandchildren gunner's three little ones sister irby's grands mary ann's babies so south carolina is where her grandparents live and here she's kind of talking about all the identities that they have there and how they're not these kind of individual people that they might have been in Ohio where they didn't have all these community ties built up. When they go back to South Carolina, they're really defined as a group unit by who their family is. I think there is also a point in the book where um, they Jacqueline talks a little bit about how their grandmother would call to them. And she would run their names all together, um, her and her two older siblings. And I think that's when you grow up in a small town and you have like your siblings or like your group of like cousins or whatever it is there, you very often are grouped into things and called like, I love that. It's like the three little ones. Like, I think that's so cute. And no matter how big they got, that was pretty much like what they, that's who they were. That was tied into their identity as people who lived in South Carolina was they weren't just, you know, Jacqueline, Hope and Odella. They were also the grandchildren. And family. So too, I have a twin sister. And so, um, until my cousin had twins, we were the twins. It was like, so, like, oh, they're over there and the twins are there. But then my cousin had twins. And now we, and now we really are no longer. Then, it got, then there were two. Yeah. But, but also, my cousin had twins when I was 28. So, you know, I, I, it didn't even matter. Like, hopefully, at this point, my par- my family calls me by my name, but... I could also get called a different person's name and I will respond because I know what they mean. <laughs> but I, but I also think it's like, it kind of shows the like community that they had there, mm-hmm. especially connected to the like Jehovah's witness church, like that, like every person who would kind of was in their community was connected to the like kingdom hall and, and all of that. So I think, yeah, like in, I'm I'm not from a small town at all, so I'm making very wide generalizations. So please correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm assuming that th- there's only I'm there's one kingdom hall. Everyone knows everyone. Everyone mm-hmm. is connected to someone, mm-hmm. and that's how they build the community that they have. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting though how there is this community that they're a part of, but her grandmother also is very insular about the other children in the neighborhood and really prefers that they just play with each other and not so much with the other kids in the neighborhood. So it's an interesting kind of dichotomy between those two things, which I don't really... I wonder if it's because they're younger or if it's because because they don't like 
they don't know like the rules of the south and they're like worried that they'll get into something that they shouldn't yeah mm. maybe or if they aren't jehovah's witnesses oh, or if they're not jehovah's witnesses yeah i would just like yeah. to say um challenge mode how many times can we say the word dichotomy during this i do say <laughs> that used, a lot it's been used at least twice because i've said it and i just heard laura say it so michelle uh for the audience at home it's my so it's my hidden password i'm gonna use it all right um a tagline said it can also be kind of frustrating when you're seen exclusively as a group which is definitely true we definitely can see that in the story a little bit um we'll go to the next quote i think that idea will keep coming up as well I am born in Ohio, but the stories of South Carolina already run like rivers through my veins. I just liked this. I thought it was pretty. I know the running like rivers through my veins imagery is certainly not new imagery, but I think this really sums up her identity of her family legacy and home and family and how those things all intertwine in her. There's a part at the beginning when we're for, when we are still when Jacqueline and her family still live with her dad and we're talking a little bit about dad's mom who's also from the south and about how she and mom got along so well because they just like understood each other and like would share stories about growing up in the south and what that felt like and what that was like and I think that's part of legacy too is like and home, the idea of home, right? Is that in this woman, Jacqueline's mother was able to find a little piece of home, a little bit of South Carolina. Um, and so they shared those stories and those stories also become Jacqueline and Hope and Odella's legacy. Definitely. I agree. Dichotomy. Dichotomy. All right. Thinking, uh, speaking of dichotomy, the next the next quote uh, shows it really well. It's a great example. Oh, perfect. Ohio and Greenville, Woodson and Irby, Gunner's child and Jack's daughter, Jehovah's Witness and non-believer, listener and writer, Jackie and Jacqueline, gather into one world called you where you decide what each world and each story and each ending will finally be. And this and is all... the end of the book. Yeah. And I think it really sums up. The book ends when she is 11, which is when you're just really starting to kind of come of age into your own identity. And I think this describes that so well and how there are lots of different parts to everybody and you can take things from your family and your past and also take things that are individually yours and decide for yourself how those things are going to impact who you want to be. I do think it's interesting she chose to kind of end the story before she started making her own choices as a person. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't the story necessarily of how Jacqueline Woodson became Jacqueline Woodson. Yeah. This is the story of how this one little girl this is just her history and this is the history of so many people and like the names of towns and the names of people might be different but the experience of that is the same and it all depends like as you get older what you do with what you learn and I think it's a really interesting choice to not show us how that ended up being applied to her and how that impacts her in like a hindsight way she's just presenting all of this very matter of fact and it's up to us to see to like now find that same trail in her fiction and in her work um she doesn't really do the work for us which is a nice challenge it's also probably um you get a, a feel for that more because it's written in verse like i think if mm -hmm. it was a straight up like sentence and then this happened and then we did this like it would be it would be shorter but it also i think you 
it wouldn't yeah it, she would lay everything out for us very simply and i think we get to do a lot of our own like running through the themes and stuff mm -hmm. because it's written like this in this way and so it's smart of her to do it that way and you can like infer more things for yourself and um yeah, and have I think also you get to she gets she got to spotlight some like really cool things throughout the story that I think would have been harder to do if she if this was just like a written mm -hmm. like essentially like novelization of her life. Like you get to have these like characters like come in and out, like in real life, like family members just kind of like dropping in and out and and here's like a short story about her a short message about her uncle who goes to jail and then like here's something about like her cousins and like her a funeral of, and like all of this stuff is like or her friend that she makes in brooklyn like oh mm -hmm. yeah it, it was smart to kind of do it in this way i also think poetry like inherently asks like the form of writing in verse often triggers this like feeling inside of all of us hashtag thanks American public education system where you're supposed to read more into it than like a typical book like with poetry like you're supposed to be trying to like figure it out and like with fiction it can there are books like that where they ask you like to like give it a little bit more what's the hidden meaning but with poetry it's become this like built-in thing for us like you just assume with poetry you're going to have to do a lot of the work in a way you don't normally have to do in fiction. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to the beginning of this quote, I do think the just all these comparisons to things in her life, it just makes me think that it would be really interesting to have a follow-up book to this where you go through like that reconnection with her father um her when does she become a non-believer when does she leave the religion um seeing her coming to understand her sexuality which isn't touched upon at all in this book because she is 11 when it ends so even if it's something she knew about herself it's maybe not playing such a big part in her life yet um so I don't know. It does, like Ali said, it leaves a lot open, but it's also like, oh, there's a lot I still want to know more about. I want her to do a brown teen dreaming. <laughs> brown young woman dreaming. <laughs> Beautiful. Rolls Just keep off the going. Dog. Just keep going, Jacqueline. All the ages. All of them. Brown hey. mid-30s dreaming. Please. I would be so interested. I would uh, read that. A hundred percent. I would, tell me what to do. I, yeah, I, I understand why it ends there. And I think it's like a good ending point, but I also, it felt a little, especially, I think maybe it wouldn't have felt that way if I didn't, the next chapter read about all of this interesting stuff. And I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Right. reconnecting with her family and like learning all this stuff about her history like yeah yeah it, tell me more it, tell me, me more truly i was like i wanted to read this more than i wanted to read some other stuff that was in this book like no shade like it was all good and like i en enjoyed it but um yeah i don't know i think also right i think the target I, there's a reason why it's for like third and fifth graders. I am, it's been a long time since I have been in third or fifth grade. So there's that. Um, yeah, I really wanted to know more about so many things and yeah. with her family and even different, like if it was brown girl dreaming, but it was just from her sister's perspective, I think would be so interesting. Um, or if it was brown boy dreaming from her brother's perspective. And like, even there was like a, a short part about her kind of her brother reckoning with the fact that their dad was gone and like what that was doing with him mm -hmm. in the beginning. I thought that was so interesting. And I was like, oh, I want it. I want to know more about what he's going through and and all of the things that he's thinking. Um, I think because she was because she was so young, it, I think a lot of the like complexities of that w weren't really like registering for her. So I, I, yeah. 
the half brother that we haven't talked about. Oh my gosh! Half brother develops pika, wow. which is like an uncontrollable urge to eat things that aren't food, and he ends up really, really sick in the hospital because he has this compulsion to eat paint that has lead in it and he gets very sick and i'm like i want to know what's going on in his life that he has developed the anxiety to develop this compulsion what is it like from being separated from his siblings while he's alone in the hospital and he's yeah. making himself sick but he can't stop like i want to know what's going on there Okay, that was very interesting to me. I will just plug my like own city kid thing about this because I don't know if this is how it was in any other place in the world, but I grew up in the 90s in New York and from like a very young age in the 90s, there was a giant push on like TV and radio. And I remember some people came to our school and were like, don't eat paint it's lead paint chips off the wall and it was like everywhere everywhere they talked about it like the ch don't eat paint chips on the wall don't eat paint chips on the wall because they realized that it was the lead poisoning that was killing kids and i don't know if that was everywhere else but i that like when that was happening to him that took me straight back to my childhood of like truly watching like a sesame street commercial being like you see these chips coming off the wall don't eat them or you'll die gosh it wow. was it was like so like such a thing that was like ingrained in my mind and so when that was happening to him to the in the book i was like oh obviously it's because he ate paint chips like i knew off the mm -hmm. top because of yeah. this like very ingrained thing growing up in new york so that was wild to me that and then i i now realize that that wasn't happening everywhere in the world but it was happening a lot in new york in in the 90s guys i just realized that our heads are in clouds on the stream but they also could be in paint chips <laughs> all right we'll go to the next quote Um, so I think this is our final section that we're going to talk mm -hmm. about, which is about reading and writing. You guys know I always like to try to find like the lightest topic to end things with since we've read some pretty heavy books for this. Um, so Folks, it still about... isn't that light. Just a heads up. It still yeah. isn't that light. That is correct. But, you know, I did my best with what I had. So let's go. All right. I am not gifted. When I read the words twist, twirl across the page. When they settle, it is too late. The class has already moved on. I want to catch words one day. I want to hold them, then blow gently, watch them float right out of my hands. I just thought this is a really great passage to have in a book for preteens and younger teens in particular. Yes. Um, that here's this woman who has experiences with words and reading that probably a lot of them can relate to from their own lives. And she has made words her life and her career. And that just because you do something differently or it takes you more time doesn't mean you're bad at it it doesn't mean you're not smart it just means that what one classmate does one way you might do the other and you can still figure it out right i don't need to add to that but all right was it like a signal that she was dyslexic was that the like thing so that just... we were supposed to infer I just Googled that under the table, um, just to triple check, and it did not immediately confirm. So I, I don't know, turns out. I had that question when I was reading it, but she never too. brought it up again, so. Yeah. Yeah, it was like one of those, like, is it dyslexia or is it that she's comparing herself to her, like, gifted older sister who, for whom school is incredibly easy? Yes. All right, next quote. In cursive too, please. But the Q in Jacqueline is too hard. So I write Jackie Woodson for the first time. Struggle only a little bit with the K. Is that what you want us to call you? I want to say no, my name is Jacqueline, but I am scared of that cursive Q. 
This one just made me mad that a teacher would make her feel like if she gets one thing wrong, that's not okay, and that it has to be perfect so that she changes her name for her. And I don't know, also just this idea of in her circumstance, she's changing her name because of stress about writing. But I think we do see this so many times with teenagers taking on more Americanized names because their teachers or classmates say that their name is too hard to pronounce or da, 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 when they can pronounce all these other things. But suddenly your name is too hard. I don't know. I'll start ranting. It just made me mad. <laughs> I think that's really interesting because I actually did not read this passage like that at all. Did not either. Yeah, I just got like the, she just was really nervous about the cue and I don't necessarily think the teacher made her feel that way. I think she's just like an anxious little baby. And also when you're a kid and you're writing on the board, there's like incredible pressure for no reason. Like, but I do, I agree with your points about changing names to make them easier for other people. But I think in this case, um, for Jacqueline, right, she she has to go by this other name because she's scared of being ridiculed, but it kind of is just like that little kid, like something bad will happen to me, not necessarily like this is going to be the consequence if you mess this up. So I guess I more just felt like it's the teacher's responsibility to be able to see that she's an anxious kid who is stressed out about it and like recognize that those emotions are happening. I don't know. Yeah. I think I also know. kids have more agency now to be like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah. I think because the me. rest of us, the rest of us went by names we didn't like for so long that now every kid we meet, we're like, what do you want to be called though? Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that she like, she said that her name wasn't Jackie, but I wonder if she just feels like that name is like a family name and she didn't want to like expose it to the world versus Jacqueline, which she's like, this is my name that you can call me because she, at the end of the book, she's like, she go, she calls herself Jackie at some parts in her life. And then at some parts she doesn't. So I, I was like, it's not, but maybe it is, but maybe it's not a name that you f feel okay with the whole class calling you, which is mm -hmm. fully valid or, yeah. I don't know, that was interesting. I also like to kind of, you just like made me think a little bit more about how in the beginning of the book, we talk, they talked a lot about how her dad wanted to just name her Jack after himself. And I wonder if Jackie became something she was more comfortable with the closer she got to reconciliation with her father. That's a good point. We'll never know until she writes her sequel, Brown Teen Dreaming. Stay tuned. All right, next quote. Too slow, the teacher says, read faster. Too babyish, the teacher says, read older. But I don't want to read faster or older or any way else that might make the story disappear too quickly from where it's settling inside my brain, slowly becoming a part of me. Maybe I just also interpreted the last one in an angry way because there was all this stuff going on. Uh, yes. There is right more context. After. Um, again, just I think really pointing to the fact that it's very frustrating that even now people will have the impression that there is a right way to read things. There are right things to read for your age. This is too young for you. This is too old for you. Um, you need to be reading more books. You read too many books. And it's just like, who cares as long as they're reading? If you read one book a year and it takes you all year to read it, that is awesome. If you read a book a day, that is also awesome. If you are a 30-year-old woman who likes reading young adult books, that is awesome. Yeah. If you are a teenager who likes reading like adult thrillers, that's great. Like, ugh. Yeah. We are I, like parents and we support whatever and however you want to read. Or if you just like audiobooks, that's also that's a book reading. Reading. and it counts. Graphic novels are reading. Right. 
Um, as a as a professionally slow reader who was a huge bookworm, everyone's always like, oh my gosh, you're always reading. Like, how many books do you read a year? And I'm like, not as many as you think I do, buddy, because I am... I only read books once really. So like for me, it is, I can't speed through a book because I know that I will never touch this book again. Like no matter how much I liked it, like I don't care. I like don't reread stuff um, because there's always more new stuff I want to read. And as a slow reader, I have to like make those choices. And so I really related to this of like too babyish, too slow, like there's no right or wrong way to read. And uh, this just goes to show you don't have to read every book in the world to be a librarian. Because I sure don't. Laura, don't interact. But I sure don't. Well, I think even going off of that, there's this idea, which as a fast reader, I had to get to a point where I realized that wasn't true. Of There's this idea of there are certain books that like you have to read and you should yeah. have read. And you know, to be an educated person, you have to have read these books. And By a bunch of dead white men? Yeah, and it took really? me until I got a little older. 90% of them are boring. Where I was like, if I'm not interested in this book, it doesn't matter what other people say about it. I don't have to read it. Yeah, there's lots of jokes, you know. I mean, this has been like a long-standing thing of like young adult and romance primarily being under marketed because it's primarily read by women and female identifying people and young people mm -hmm. and the publishing very much writes those types of people off. But if that's what you like to read, that's what you like to read. And people are often like, oh, are you reading trash? No such thing. Get out of my business. Like you're reading trash. I think Hemingway is trash. Like it's all subjective and you shouldn't feel bad for not liking books assigned by school. You don't, uh, liking a book is not a prerequisite for understanding it and literally write a paper on it and burn it out of your brain. That's what I did. And I have a literature degree. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, next slide. If someone had taken that book out of my hand, said, you're too old for this, maybe I'd never have believed that someone who looked like me could be in the pages of the book, that someone who looked like me had a story. Uh, we'll just shout out, this is a library book that she has. Good job, Jacqueline Woodson's Childhood Library. <laughs> For sure. Um, and this like speaks a little bit to what we've also been talking about, but just this idea of the she was reading a children's book when she was older than the target age, but it was the first time she saw like a young black girl represented in this form of media. And that made her believe that she could, you know, she could read, she could write, she could do all these things. And if she had listened to everyone else about what she should or should not read, and maybe she never would have seen that. Um, because I do think a lot of times we can see more and better inclusion in books for younger people. I don't know. I love that because especially from someone like her who is essentially like one of the, when we think about diversity in books and diverse authors, she is always at the top of the list. She's mm -hmm. one of the like people who like, that publishers would point to and be like, look at this black woman's writing. It is so successful. Black people want to hear from other black people. Let's publish more black people mm -hmm. in, in young adult genres because that wasn't always the case. And it's more of the case now. It's definitely more popularized now, but she definitely was like at the forefront of that. So I, I thought that was like really cool that that's kind of like, towards the end of the book that she like kind of became full circle in that way i love that point um because she became that for so many other mm -hmm. young black girls and i think that's just like really i didn't like i don't think i fully got the impact of that until you were just talking about it michelle but like yeah like that is her now somebody goes to the shelf and picks up her books and feels the way that she did picking up that picture book um and I'm as sure someone, she was 
Yeah. Oh, I, I was gonna. I'm sure she's one of the first black authors I did. I mean, it was like her and Walter Dean Myers, and like those was, were yeah. the black authors that you could find at your library. So I'm sure that's. I'm sure that was like the first one that I read. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a reason, right? We have a memoir about her, and and like this beautiful story. Like people wanted to know what, and I think that's. Like, if we think about it through that lens, like, people probably were asking, like, what made her special? What inspired her? And thinking about the way that she presented her history in the book, it really just shows you that it could be anyone. And some of that self-discovery was sheer luck. Like, if she hadn't picked up that book, if someone had taken it away from her, the Jacqueline Woodson we have, like, the whole, like, not to, like, overstate, but, like, the entire course of literature would be different without Jacqueline mm -hmm. Woodson. And I think, yeah. I don't think it's unfair to say that. No. Um, mm -mm. Like, and so, as someone who, like, curates picture books as well for my collection, it's, this is something I, like, try to be really conscious of because you never know when a child is going to need themselves to be reflected. And this is why they're, like, I recommend picture books to my older readers because, it is nice sometimes to just see a character who looks like you experiencing joy. And so much of like literature is about people suffering and picture books aren't like that. Like, and it's really nice to just see yourself or someone who looks like you in the pages of a book, having a good time. And everyone should read You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnson about a, a black girl finding romance and joy with a joyful black girl on the cover. Okay, next quote. And it's nice to read it like, Tiger like until Leah we Johnson. sent you. There's no, more quote. There's no more quotes, Laura. You can't segue into quotes, Laura. There are no more. <laughs> okay, no more quotes. We're going to give you guys some shout outs to some of our upcoming virtual events. Um... So thank you guys so much for joining us. So first off, if you are interested in role-playing games, you can visit bit.ly slash BPL teen events, I believe is the link to sign up for our bite-sized RPGs from three to five on July 29th. That will be on Zoom, I believe. Yes, that will be on Zoom. Um, so that's coming up at the end of the month. And then oh. on July 30th from about 3 to 3.30, Allie and I will be over on Instagram Live at BPL Boston Teens talking about some of the August releases that we are excited about. I think we might wrap up the end of July as well, but then we will be moving to always talking about what's coming out next month, as well as what we're reading now. Um, we will be recommending books if you pop by. If you can't make it, it will be on Instagram and eventually on YouTube for you to watch after the fact as well. And then the next book that we will be discussing for our Twitch book club is um, Where We Go From Here by Lucas Rocha. And you can check this out uh, at bpl.org. For the month of August, it will be available without a wait um, as an ebook. And you can visit bpl.org slash year long to sign up for a year long reading challenge. Each month has a different theme. You can complete the months at any time. So if you read a lot during the summer, you can definitely catch up a little bit. Um, but that is all for today. Thank you guys wait, so much wait, for joining. It's not oh. all for today. It's are not you all reading, for today. Are you reading books? Do you like to read books? We have a summer reading program. Oh. You should. Oh, yep. You should tell us about the books that you're reading. You literally only need to read nine books. And again, we don't necessarily care what they are as long as you're reading or listening to them. Comics, count. Ebooks, count. Audiobooks, count. Whatever you're reading or listening to, we want to know about it. You can enter for prizes and other cool things. So check with your local branch to see what they're doing. Um, in that same vein, if you are between the ages of five and 17, you are eligible for our Read Your Way to Fenway contest. So you will write us a little tiny essay about a book that you read, enjoyed, hated. Just tell us about it. Turn it into your local branch for the opportunity to potentially win three free tickets to a Red Sox game. Now we're done, maybe. Yay, now we're done. <laughs> All right. 
Hopefully we'll see some of you guys next month. Thank you for joining us. In person, come to the library. Ooh, yeah. open. Come visit Do that. Us. Check out yeah. books. We want to give you book racks. Books, books, books. Thank mm-hmm. you.